Okay. Today is, uh, let me see, uh, Bob will be joining us, Dathan will be joining us in a few moments. Um, September 8, 2014, tonight we have a special board meeting uh, and a uh, committee of the whole. We will be uh, speaking on, and Becky will be presenting the final uh, draft of the budget for the 2014-15 uh, school year, at which time we will have a public hearing on the budget, and uh, following that we will uh, uh, proceed with our regular board meeting and standard agenda. Uh, as everybody knows, the public hearings is important, and uh, this is the culmination of one of the two main functions that this board does, and that's adopt the budget and set policy. So uh, we will be eagerly awaiting Becky's information for at least the one of the 1A. So, um, Becky, would you please take a roll? Dan Collins. Here. Dathan Paterno. Scott Zimmerman. Here. Dr. Borelli. Here. Vicki Lee is here. Bob Johnson. Bob should be coming in on telephone. Um, and John Heidi. He, he was supposed to call in, supposed to be in. Do we have to do anything with our phone here? Yes, we have to call in as the host And I don't know that phone number. Is Scott here? Does Scott know the phone number? He was here. Uh, somewhere I do here. I have his cell number. And I have the code, but I don't have the phone number. Welcome to AT&T's teleconference service. Please enter your access code, followed by the pound sign. To join the conference, Bob, are you there? Yes, yeah, Bob. Okay, hi. All right, we're 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 about to get started. Uh, Vicki, uh, as you can see, uh, Bob is now in attendance. Okay. All righty, so the first thing is the Committee of the Whole, and that brings us to the presentation of the budget for 2014-15. Becky? Um, Bob, and, I sent you the uh, PowerPoint earlier. Um, today so that you could follow along. I'm not sure if you got it or not. If you have your computer uh, available. No, I wanted to work out a small mobile device. So yeah, just go ahead without me. Okay. Well, tonight we're going to look at budget draft three, and hopefully it is our final draft before we adopt it at the um, regular scheduled uh, September board meeting. Um, the board still has the ability to make changes to the budget if they see fit after this presentation tonight. And Vic, would you like to have questions at the end or as we're going through this? As we're going through. Okay. As you've heard me say a hundred times, uh, a budget is designed to meet the budgetary requirements under the Illinois school code. Um, the document under tab four in your packet um, is the legal school budget. It probably means nothing to any of us in that format, other than the people at the State Board of Education, because that's the format all school districts are required to file it at. And I'm a Stephen Covey person, um, and one of his seven habits of highly effective people is begin with the end in mind. So since we always ask the question, what are the day's cash on hand, I thought we'd start there tonight instead of waiting for it to be the final slide. Um, so day's cash on hand, um, as you will see, with the way we ended our budget 
um, on June 30th with a budget surplus. In the way that we're adopting our budget, um, or being presented tonight and adopted at the September 22nd board meeting, um, we should, if all things are equal, if you extrapolate everything out to 2021, have 125 days cash on hand, awfully close. It is better than what we presented in February because of the way we ended the school year. And then the graph on the bottom of the page is um, just showing what the annual expenditures would look like. And then that um, kind of broken line with the dots, solid line with the dots, solid dots, um, trends what the day's cash on hand would be. So that you can look at it in two different ways. Some people are, um, like to look at it as the graph in the upper right hand corner and some like to look at it in the format that's at, on the bottom. So I always like to provide one or two different options um, for you to look at the information. But again, our board policy says that we will, at the end of each fiscal year, have four months of operating expenditures for this fiscal year then ended and the expenses shall be measured against a cumulative total of the operating funds. So I think the good news tonight, if there's good news, um, it's uh, 125 days cash on hand, taking us out to the board's extended referendum commitment of 2021. Okay, um, on that I have a question. Sure. I, noticing the differential between these years, there's about 22, 23 million dollars. And so the way I look at this, that's a 23 million dollars expense more than revenue coming in, Correct. so we keep drawing down. Correct. Now, currently I looked at our expenses versus our revenues, and we're not $23 million behind. So my question is, what are the things that would cause that delta, to use Scott's term, because I like that, That's, delta means a lot. What makes that delta grow to $23 million a year? What, what happens there? Well, um, when you look at the revenues going forward, we're limited by the CPI for property taxes, right. which means your revenues are if, probably, um, the next time I do this, and I'll make a note, is to do a graph that shows um, the trending of revenues and the trending of expenditures, and you're gonna see a point where expenditures start to exceed, and that graph is gonna continue to grow um, wider as we get towards 2021. And that's why you have the slope in that bottom graph and the slope at the upper graph that we're, we're going to be deficit spending. Um, but if you go back to the referendum in 2007, the commitment or the, the story that was being told is that it was highly likely that we, taxing and, and maximizing our revenues every one of those 10 years um, that we would probably start deficit spending at year five, and so that you would continue to um, have revenues exceed expenditures through the fifth year of that commitment, and years five through 10, we would start to deficit spend. This board should pat themselves on the back for managing its expenses so that we are in um, year seven, and we're still uh, with a small surplus of revenues over expenditures. And the, um, this deficit spending, there's, there's, I mean, arguably with increases, the expenses are gonna outstrip the revenue increases. So there's no, no possible way of avoiding that eventuality, correct? Well, there are ways to manage your expenses and that's limit the rate of increase in your expense pattern as you go forward through 2021. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest component, as you're gonna see in a minute, is salaries and benefits. So that if you manage the expenses in those two categories, um, then the, that graph at 2021 and the gap between revenue and expenditures would, would narrow if you reduce expenditures going forward. So basically the yearly deficit wouldn't be as great. Correct. And we potentially can carry it out for another year or two. You could do that. Yes. But it's, it, it's truly up to this board to provide guidance to the administration to um, manage those expenses and, and, and pretty much indicate to us 
what you want that or what's permissible um, for that uh, gap between revenues and expenditures. And I, and I know these questions somewhat are rhetorical, but I think it's important that the explanation gets out there so that people are quite aware of where this money is going. Correct. And I, I think as a public body, um, we have a responsibility to make sure that we clearly communicate. And sometimes I look at this stuff so often that um, I think it's as clear as can be, and some days it's as clear as mud. So um, I think continually asking those questions provides the community, and I do know that a lot of our community members do watch our videos of our board meetings, um, the clarity they may be seeking. Yeah, and I, I think to put a point on this, I mean, this is both the most important part or point in our finances, and it is also, um, yeah, I think in the way you talked about managing our expenses perhaps made it sound a little easier than it actually is. <laughs> You're absolutely um, right. <laughs> you know, kind of the key point of the group that looked at the need for the referendum in the run-up to 2007 was that our revenues grow slower than our expenditures. Mm -hmm. they will. Our revenues are, for the most part, limited to the rate of inflation, and our expenditures usually, in fact nearly always, grow faster than the rate of inflation. Uh, the salary growth is close to the rate of inflation, but if you throw in employee benefits growing faster, if you throw in energy costs growing faster, in the 10 years up to the 2007 referendum, we also added 600 students to the district, you know, et cetera. Um, you know, various pressures like that cause expenditures to rise faster than the rate of inflation. So what was communicated to the community at the time of the 2007 referendum was that if you pass this, you'll put in an infusion of cash. It will cause a big surplus mm -hmm. immediately. And every year thereafter, the surplus will be a little smaller than it was the year before. Eventually, it will go into deficit spending. And eventually, we will run enough of a deficit that we will no longer have enough days on cash on hand, and we will need to do another referendum. Right. Uh, and, and the key then isn't, can we avoid another referendum? The question is, when will the next referendum be? And we've always wanted the answer to be no time soon, and I think we <laughs> still do. Uh, so we've extended that date out four years. We originally promised 2017. We're now committing to 2021. That's a good thing. But someday it will come to an end and, and we will need a referendum. Um, you talked about managing our expenditures, and I think that's true, but it's important to point out that in order to manage our expenditures to bring the rate of expense growth below the rate of inflation, we would need to lay off staff cut programs, uh, you know, or perhaps drive a hard enough bargain in salary negotiations Correct. that people's wages easy. and salaries right. on a real inflation-adjusted basis are, are losing over time. And, uh, you know, I, any of those things are possible if the board chooses to do them, uh, but it's worth pointing out that none of those things are easy. You know, they're not, they don't go in the category of kind of routine management of your expenses, right. let's put it that way. Well, and as you look at um, this graph and those numbers, it's important to know what we have in place today continues all the way out through 2021. So um, it, it's not taking anything away. And truly, um, the key point is every year when the December CPI is released in January, and we update the financial projections based upon that most recent CPI that's issued. Um, right now, um, we go one and a half, two, one and a half, two, so that we fluctuate it that way. If we have a good year and it's two and a half or three, um, that just increases your revenue stream and would truly change the outlook of that. Doesn't mean that you spend those additional resources, it just makes that you may narrow the gap between revenues and expenditures. Other questions? The um, statement of position is in your binder tonight, and this is just the operating funds, and I've circled the subtotal for the operating funds um, prior to the capital projects. Um, and we show a budget surplus of $640,709, or 69.7% of our operating expenditures that are projected for June 30th, 2015. 
If you take a look at our capital projects and we add that in, and that will show a surplus um, because of the bond sale that we did in um, the spring. That brought in additional resources to fund our capital improvements and so that there's not new revenues every year, small amounts of interest income, but we have a large fund balance surplus that we will be draining down over the next uh, two to three years. So that if you consider uh, capital projects, then we're showing a budget deficit of five, almost $5.2 million um, and reducing our fund balance to the operating funds of 68.7%. And because our, because our board policy says operating funds, it's really the bottom line that I should be looking at and, and speaking to. But again, I think it's a bit distorted because of the bond sale and the infusion of cash um, for June 30th um, of this year and how we will deficit spend for the next couple of years in that particular fund. That's why I separate the two just for information. Questions on that? So if nothing changes tonight, we will ask you at the September board meeting to adopt a budget that has um, an operating fund, $70,235,494 in revenue, and expenditures of $75,416,999. It doesn't have the debt service fund in that, but it, we would add that to it. I just can't get that on that slide when I copy it in. So where does the money come from and where does the money go? Um, in a graphical form. I should have made those fonts maybe white so that you could actually see them. Um, if you look at the revenue, you can see that um, what we've just talked about in property taxes and that CPI, we are a district that is heavily reliant on our local property taxes. And so um, typically your constituents, your community has a um, vested interest in how we prepare budgets and how we spend money. Um, but again, 85% of our revenues come from property taxes. 6% um, comes from state revenue. 11% um, comes from state and federal. So 2% is the general state aid and then another 2% for federal aid. So, um, and then the rest comes from um, other local income and um, student fees. If you look on the expenditure side, um, we are a district that um, is basically people. And so that um, our budget is 64% salary and 12% for benefits to support that staff. 9% um, comes from purchase services, 5% um, comes from supplies, 8% is capital, and again that's um, our uh, emphasis on capital projects and um, that basically includes the field HVAC project. And then other expenses is just 2%. Um, since we've been through this in great detail, um, and I think in Dr. Hines' um, memorandum to you, I said concentrate on tab one, the changes. And these are the changes from draft one to draft three. So some of these changes you saw on draft two in July when I, we adjusted the budget when new information was known to us. But if you'll remember, Mr. Heidi asked that I prov provide this comparison and I didn't quite get it done. Um, to compare draft one and draft two, so now it's draft one to draft three. So um, some of this information may be redundant. Um, in July, we reported that there would be about $194,000 additional revenue and property taxes, and that's because the Cook County Clerk uh, finalized the 2013 tax extension at the end of June, and um, we redistributed some fun, uh, funds amongst the funds. funds. That's a tongue twister. Um, and there's a concern um, when I look at the maximum tax rates. I, I didn't think in my lifetime as a business manager, which is coming to me, um, I would ever see um, a district attain their maximum tax rates. For instance, in the education fund, the most we can levy from a rate perspective is $3.50. Um, the, the ed rate, um, last year was almost $3.49 or $3.49 because that's declining EAV, which we're experiencing right now, and I truly hope with the 2013 levy that we've hit rock bottom with assessed values going down, the tax rates go up. 
And so if we hit that $3.50, the county clerk wouldn't extend any more money for us in that particular fund. So we're going to have to look very closely when we do the levy in December as to what funds we levy in. Now in the education fund, we have some capacity in a special ed rate where we've only levied about two cents and we could actually go up to 40 cents so that we have uh, flexibility there. Um, and then the other funds will want to shore up our fund balance so that um, when that tax rate in the ed fund actually goes back down again, we can draw down on fund balance. So um, we'll have some redistribution of funds um, over the next several years, I would imagine. Um, corporate personally property, corporate personally, personal property replacement tax, I think they find easier names for these things, uh, is going up about 43000 and that's just an adjustment based upon prior year taxes. Um, and I've looked out on the State Board, or the State Department of Revenue's webpage. They have just posted something that, about estimated revenues during the 14-15 uh, um, budget year. And we may receive slightly more, but it's not going to be much more than we're anticipating right now. Um, an additional $96,000 for student fees, and that's between the Education Fund and the Transportation Fund. And that's just an adjustment based upon um, the prior year receipts. Um, when we did the draft of the budget in May, we hadn't received any TIF money, um, so we are carrying it at last year's budget, so we've adjusted that down 135000 Most of these adjustments, again, were made in um, July when we brought draft two to you. Um, general state aid is going up 23000 and this is a new change. Um, sometime mid-August, ISBE notified us of what the actual claim would be for this year, and so we've added an additional 23,000. Other state income, um, it's being reduced by $18,246, and that's uh, based upon the claim that we submitted to ISBE for our transportation services. Um, and federal income is going up 217,000, and I've itemized on the side that it's um, the IDEA grant, which uh, supports our special needs students, up 28,000. Um, Title I, which is a new revenue source for us this year, of 276,000. And Medicaid, Medicare, what is Medicaid? Fee for service and outreach, uh, reduction of 87,000. And that's just based upon the um, receipts that we got last year. And it, it, it it fluctuates as in the timing of when we receive those receipts. So I would imagine it will go down um, slightly. That's it on the revenues. I would take questions on the revenue change. I'm sure I missed something, but the Title I you said is new revenue. What, what's an example of that? Um, Title I, Dr. Hines, I will let you uh, clarify what title funds are used for. It's our low income students. Um, so we have set aside money for the Title I account to offset the cost of a new math intervention uh, teacher that we've hired, some new intervention programs that we're going to bring into the district to help support um, our math data and our new program and some of our students that are struggling in math. So it's going to allow us to really target those funds to help areas where we're sluggish or where we have more um, at-risk kids. You know, in either, perhaps not at this point, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about the sure. Title I grant before we do it, because this is a, as I understand it, this for us is a new program. It's a federal program that has existed for years and years, and for whatever reason, District 64 has never participated in the Title I program. So as I understand it, this year a decision is being made to enroll in it for the first time. One thing I'd like to make sure before we actually enroll in it is that the board fully understands uh, what strings are attached to that money. You know, for instance, what are we now responsible for by taking Title I money that we would not have been responsible for, you know, for uh, just under state law, if anything? And maybe mm -hmm. there's nothing, but uh, I, you know, would just like to make sure I understand fully what we're getting into before we do it. Sure. Expenditure changes. Um, salaries are going up $151,000. And it's broken down into um, administrative salaries. Um, and we've adjusted um, the salary line item for the field interim assistant principal and for some per diem days for our assistant principals 
because they came in in July when they're typically not on the payroll for an administrative retreat. Um, exempt, exempt staff, um, we've just adjusted those for the actual salaries that the board has approved. Um, under the teachers, there's an increase for that Title I math interventionist salary. Um, summer school, Title I, it's for a summer school program that we will do for our low-income students and neediest students. And then staff development, um, there's additional offerings of, um, this past summer we offered more staff development for staff because of the one-to-one um, -one initiative. And it was an additional 45,000. I wasn't aware of that when we put draft one together. So we had to add that budget line item. Questions on the salary increases? I'm gonna ask questions after each category. Do you have a sense of out of the 276,000 we get for Title I, how much of that is offset by the salary and benefit increases? So if I understand the, the question right, versus Be revenue. Becky, we're getting 276,000 in new revenue. Correct. How much are we spending on new expenditures and how much of that is salaries? Is that uh, about 50. And, and benefits. Yeah. 50,000 um, for the teacher, plus or minus 1,000 or so, and the 45,000 is the benefits total. And the benefits total is so high because we are required when we pay a salary out of federal funds to contribute 35% of that salary um, to the Illinois Teacher Retirement System. 35? 35. 35. And Becky, to answer... Actually, it's 2% less than it was last year. To answer the other part of that question, how much of the 276 in new revenue is offset by new expenditures, the answer is all of it. All right? of it. Okay. So the, yeah. the Title I grant is revenue neutral to the Correct. district. Correct. That's what so, I was getting at. Yeah. There is a federal law that says you can't supplant funds. So if I bought a pencil this year or last year out of local money and I wanted to buy the same pencil this year, I can't buy it out of federal funds. So they have to be new expenses that we incur. Good. Under purchase services, we're increasing 601,000. Um, I've broken it down by fund and put some categories in there because some of these are Title I expenses and I wanted to make sure that those were itemized. Um, and um, so we have, um, under the Ed Fund, CEC and Strategic Planning, I've added $48,000 for that. Professional Growth, um, $50,000. And this is like a quirky part of administrative contracts that says we're allotted $3,500 um, per administrator uh, in professional growth on an annual basis, and we're allowed to carry it over for one year. Last year, our administrative team didn't do a lot of professional growth, and so when we did the budget in, um, obviously, the beginning of May, I wasn't aware that we were gonna spend more funds than we, were, we did, and then in July, I hadn't had the opportunity to go through and look administrator by administrator what the carryover would be. So when I take this year's allocation and what the carryover is last year, that's the add to the budget. I know it sounds like a lot of money, and I would imagine at the end of the year, uh, most of those funds will not be spent, but I tend to budget for what a possible expense could be, and it can't be spent on anything else. So it's, it's geared towards that. If we don't spend it, it's just an under expenditure for the budget. Legal fees are going up by 90,000, um, delay in billing, I'm not sure how to explain it any other way, a delay in billing from a particular law firm um, for an ongoing case. Um, we received a bill after July 1st for uh, March, April, May, and June, and it was quite substantial, so I hadn't included in the budget, in obviously in May, and um, was not in the July draft of the budget, so I've added that to that line item. And then homeless transportation, um, we have various, we probably have four or five children in our district that qualify under um, the Homeless Act, uh, McKinley-Vento Act, and um, it's under Title I, their transportation services are a permissible expense, so we've added $20,000 there. In the O&M fund, I actually reduced purchases, 
purchase services by $25,000 for the architect and other engineering. But when you look down uh, the capital projects fund, you'll see I've added 115, and I'll explain that in a second. In transportation, um, and we'll spend a little bit of time on this, for regular transportation, we've added $267,350. Uh, for our special ed transportation, I reduced it by almost 41000 and that's just based upon last year's actual spend, and we did not see an increase from SEPTRAN and or um, I wasn't aware of one for the taxi cab services that we use. Uh, but regular transportation is going up as a result of Last year we transported 1,800 students. This year we've tra we're transporting 2,100 students. Um, last year our buses were um, overcrowded. Mr. Mackle tells me that Mrs. Lee called him up several times about buses being overcrowded. And because we had overcrowded buses um, and the time to load and unload buses, uh, we didn't always get children to school on time. And so that it was important as we uh, planned the routing um, this year to make sure that number one, our buses weren't overcrowded and that we planned our routes um, to make sure that kids got to school on time. Um, it was nice to hear principals say on the first day of school, thank you, um, because all kids got to school um, on time and buses were there and ready to take them home in the afternoon. We have a very short window between bell times from middle school to elementary and it makes it difficult to plan transportation unless we do what we did for this year um, and we're still making adjustments. Um, and I'm, I'm confident that this 267 will accommodate all the increases that we've had to make. All increases are a result of the district asking the bus company, not because of something the bus company has done without our knowledge. So um, I understand the, I guess, getting kids on to school on time, right? <laughs> it's kind of hard to argue with, right? But I mean, going from 1,800 to 2,100 students, is, can you explain how can we have 300 more? Well, I, why we have... Yeah, how come there's more kids on buses? Um, I would ask Mr. Mackle to do that. Um, it truly doesn't have anything to do with um, the hazard routes that you approved a month ago. I don't want anybody to walk away tonight believing that that um, is a result of that. I think that there are more parents working and who are going to depend on our busing system to make sure that their kids get to and from school safely. Now, if I if I can, before you start, I just want to clarify the, the concept. If you live greater than 1.5 miles from school, the district provides free busing to those students. Correct. And if it's less than 1.5 miles from school, parents pay for busing. May pay. May pay. That's, right. that's what I want to clarify before you start your discussion. What is the potential loss of between the potential between the revenue from what is paid and what it costs for those students within that 1.5 mile. There's a qualifier in there too for the um, under one and a half miles is if it's designated by IDOT as a hazardous busing area, then those kids, those students also get free. bused for free. Correct. Yes, that, that's correct. And, it's, and the, the paid rider is from 0.5 miles to 1.5 miles. So anybody that lives within a half mile of the their home school, we do not provide transportation for them. Um, to answer your question, Dan, I, I really believe that it's it's more parents, both parents working. Um, the, we're averaging, um, we're down to about 30 phone calls a day now, but for the first two weeks, we were averaging about 70 phone calls a day from people. And the really, the, the largest comment that I have is, you know, I, is, is I'm working this year and I really need to rely on you to pick up my child and they want some different accommodations. But the other piece of the pie, and thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Borelli, is we have actually had to turn down paid riders. Our, our permission slip for paid riders says that if we have room on the bus, we will allow you to pay. This is the first year in four years that I've been here that I've had to tell people, I don't have any room on the buses for you to, to let you have paid riders. Um, and that's People are upset about that, and, and I am doing some bus counts tomorrow 
I'm going to try to see if we can accommodate some of those paid riders. But right now, we only have 14 or 15 paid riders in the district. And we usually have a lot more than that, but I don't have any place to put them right now. So I, I, I can't give you a, a, a real handle on why more people are writing. It's just kind of what I'm hearing from the, from the, the parents that are calling me. Um, and then the other piece of it, too, as Becky alluded to, is middle school's out at 3. Takes 10 minutes to get the kids on the bus. And if you come by Emerson, at the end of the day, there's 15 buses trying to get out of that traffic with all of the parents trying to get out at the same time. And I need those buses, you know, to be at the elementary schools at 3.30, 3.35. And if I get there that late, then I'm fighting that traffic to get in. So I really have about a 12 to 15 minute window on which I can actually deliver kids off of the bus. And so in order to do that, that 12 to 15 minutes, we're still putting 48 kids on those buses and dropping them off in 12 to 15 minutes. But if we go any longer than that, we're, we're going to have that issue that we had last year with being late at the, at the elementary schools again. So we have definitely increased service by adding additional routes, but I will admit to you that we added a lot more routes than I thought we would. Um, we do send thing out every year for people to opt out of bus service. We usually get a pretty good amount of those. This year, we got just a handful of them. So I really believe it's just more people needing the service, Dan. That's really what I believe. And, and to clarify, more people needing service beyond the 1.5? Yes, w within the hazard areas and beyond the 1.5, correct. Yeah. Scott, do you know if the $267,000 increase here, how much of that is driven by the increase in riders versus how much of it is driven by the, uh, you know, uh, by making the buses less overcrowded? Um, I don't know that I could actually give you a percentage on that, John, but I think the majority of the issue that we have is, is the additional riders. Um, we, were, we were thinking uh, last year at Emerson we had nine routes, and as we looked at it when we did the contract and at the end of the year, uh, Vicki, I may have had a conversation with you about it. I thought I'd have to add two routes to Emerson from the ridership that I had last year. Well, we're at 15 routes now. So when I had to add six routes at Emerson, and I had to add uh, three routes at Lincoln, and I thought really I'd only have to add one. So it's, it's really, John, really driven by the ridership. We, we would have had additional routes to, to, to provide better service, but not near what I thought. But I do think part of it is the capacity piece that's, that's sure. elevating the number of buses that we need because they're not as crowded. Right. And you, you agreed on those numbers within the contract, so. The bid specs were written mm -hmm. three years ago and were re written um, this spring when we bid transportation for at the middle school, no more than two to a seat, because middle school kids can be big and they all carry backpacks and they carry instruments. And so you have to have enough room on the bus to make sure everybody's seated and safe. Um, and at the elementary school, we say three to a bus, or three to a seat. And, but when you, three to a seat is 71 passengers, you then do a 10% capacity. So you tend to back off 71 to about 60, 64 or 65 students, so that if you have new students move in, or if you want a pay rider, that you're able to accommodate that. Um, and again, I think what drives the decision when we look at buses uh, before we start school is student safety and on-time arrival. Just like the airlines, on-time arrivals. And then one more question on this, and that is from the description you gave, it sounds like we also have a decrease in paid riders. So I imagine in addition to the 267,000 increased expenditure somewhere on the revenue side, there is a decrease in revenues for paid riders this year. I haven't decreased that yet because I, frankly, it's just been the last couple of weeks that we've decided that we may not be able to account, accommodate the number of pay riders. I will know better after um, Scott does his bus counts tomorrow and um, we meet next week. I probably will leave that line item alone when we adopt the budget, knowing that I probably won't achieve that line item. Okay. Do you have any, even back of the envelope, thought as to what order of magnitude that revenue loss might be? Um, right now, for paid riders, I think I have eight on the waiting list, is what I have for people that would want to do that. And, and but I'm thinking of last year's ridership what, yeah. versus this year's. Very, very equivalent from numbers. Um, from last year to this year on the paid ridership. 
The only revenue that we're losing on the paid ridership, John, is those eight people that we just don't have room for right, right now. So and the we're fees losing about eight yeah. fees at about 500 a pop. At, at, at this point, yes, I hope with the bus counts that I can accommodate okay. them. And then the other piece of that, just so you're aware, um, is we also offer a cold weather pass, which goes from Thanksgiving to March. And, you know, we'll just have to see. We have some people that want that. I think there's two or three that want that right now. And, you know, hopefully I want to accommodate these people. I know it's important for them to get their child on the bus. So, my, you know, my, my motivation is to, is to get that child to school for those parents. So we'll, we, hope to, we hope to be able to accommodate them. Okay. Thanks. Um, in the capital projects area, we've increased architects and other engineering fees by 115000 And that's basically our Farnsworth report for Carpenter that you heard from the last board meeting. And then... Um, the ad of a construction manager to manage and see us through the repair of all that, and you'll hear more about that later. And in the Tort Immunity Fund, we added um, security uh, under purchase services is the monthly maintenance fee. Frankly, when I looked at the contracts that were approved by the board, the amounts that were listed there was the addition to the fees we were already paying, and I thought it was just the new fee. So. Um, we had to add that back into the budget. Property insurance went down from the um, May adoption by 17,000, and workers' comp went up by 38,000. Um, and everybody in our cooperative um, seems to have a lot of injuries last year, and the, the pool as a whole went up. In supplies, um, in the Ed Fund, we increased because of Title I funds and the Chromebooks, and Again, that 949000 the majority of that was added in the July version of the budget adoption. In capital outlay, we're adding 154000 and um, we had identified um, a small amount of additional needs in the um, education fund, uh, 22000 of additional project costs in the capital projects fund, and in the tort immunity, um, which we adjusted in... Um, in the July version of the budget um, for the security increases. And then in other expense in the education area, um, our InfoSnap billing charge, and they bill differently than our RevTrack uh, fee collection program did. Um, RevTrack billed the month after. So all the fees, all the receipts collected, they would bill me what I collected in June, they'd bill me in July. InfoSnap, what they, um, we collect in June and they pay me in June, they take their fees out before they send me their money. So there's not a delay in the billing. So I had to adjust the budget line item slightly for that. That assumes we will continue with InfoSnap for a second year. So. Questions, comments, concerns? I know the public hearing is at 7.15. I don't know if they're public. There's multiple documents that you're um, used to looking at um, in the revenue under tab uh, two. Um, there's a white sheet that shows you um, by object code and type of revenue and um, how it compares to last year. The um, following sheet is a comparison, the yellow sheet is a comparison of revenues by objects. And it gives you multiple years um, for revenue summary and as Mr. Heidi said at the last board meeting, this is what we used to adopt the budget on and nothing more. And then the blue sheets in there uh, in that section are the detail and multiple years um, of the revenue. The same is true under tab three for the um, expenditure budget in the same color format. Under tab four is the legal budget form that we have to file with ISBE. And under tab five is the resolution that you will pass at the next board meeting. That would conclude my remarks. I'm doing a quick calculation here, Beck. And how much has the budget changed? I can see the changes between draft one and draft three. But and those are only the only changes above $10,000 that I put in there. So that's not all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but how much has the budget changed from draft two to draft Three, because I the quick additions I did. There's an increase in revenue on on what's shown here, of the changes of five hundred thousand dollars in revenue, 
and 1.9 million in expenses. And, you know, there's, there's a month, uh, not a month, but several weeks that will occur prior to this board drafting or voting on this. Right. And, you know, just, just to give everybody plenty of time to assimilate all these changes. And obviously between tonight and the next meeting when we adopt this, that's plenty of time to assimilate these changes. But since this is a process, I'm just wondering how much of these, this change, this, this delta of $1.5 million essentially, has accumulated or incurred since version two or version three, or has it been a slow process? I don't have that number for you, but I certainly would be glad to make that calculation tomorrow and email it to the entire board. I just didn't make that calculation for this presentation. Is it safe to say that, you know, majority of that has not been all of a sudden? It's it, some occurred between draft one and draft two. Correct. Some occurred between draft two and draft three. Correct. Here's the presentation of the budget tonight. Correct. We've got a couple of weeks to do, to assimilate it. Correct. And then we'll be talking about it. Correct. Again, rhetorical questions, but right. I want people to be aware that this wasn't capriciously. No, it wasn't. Come <laughs> forward. Yes. So I'm, you know, I'm looking at this, Becky, and, and you know, the expenditures between 2013. 2014 actual and 2014-15 tentative, we're looking at uh, $13,000 less, or $13 million less, right? Much of that is the bond sale and the multiple transfers that had to be recorded as a result of um, receiving working cash bonds, transferring them to the O&M fund, transferring out of the O&M fund to the capital projects fund. And that's the 8.6 that's showing under other expense, is that where that is? So that's where we're... We're really the biggest part of that savings. Area. Correct. There's an 8.6 in the O and M fund. There's an eight million seven hundred seventy-six thousand um, dollar line item in the working cash fund. And then, although it's not delineated in the debt service fund, it's about seven hundred seventy-six thousand. So you look at that. So you take out the 8.6. We're still spending. We're, our budget's still less than what our spending was in 2013-14. I didn't make that calculation here, but I, I mean, will, it, yeah. it is. I mean, if you, if you if, right? I mean, if you take out the, the 8.6, well, it's more than 8.6. It's 8.6 times two. Because there's multiple entries. When you were, when I transfer the money between multiple funds to get it to capital projects funds. So, uh, if you're looking at the page two and um, the bottom line of. Ninety-two million one hundred fourteen thousand five hundred ninety-three. Mm -hmm. You're going to back out seventeen point two million out of there. And, and Becky, how much? Eighteen million dollars. Is this there. because when we first got the revenue, it went into the working cash? Correct. Fund. From there, it was expended and transferred into the O and M fund. You're correct. And from there, it was further expended and transferred to the capital projects fund. Correct. I see. So it shows up as double on right. the expense side. If you'll recall, Dr. Borelli had me do a chart, and I certainly can do this for the next board meeting, um, that showed this is the actual expense minus all the duplicate entries for the and the receipt of the bond sale money and. This is how the expenses net out, and I will do that for the next board meeting. Because if I was an average taxpayer, this, I think this would be the sheet I would go to, this yellow sheet, and I don't know if other board members go to a different sheet, and this would give me the impression that the expenditures are going down, but you're in fact telling me, because it's general accounting practices, that they're not. Correct. So maybe it'd be nice to have something, maybe it should be in the PowerPoint or wherever, that, that I would just like to know if you take that out, Maybe I didn't see it anywhere in here. You what know what? I will add it on the yellow sheet. Yeah, that'd be nice to know. So I mean, because I'd like to know are our expenditures actually going up or down if you take out those big capital outlays. My recollection, and don't hold me to this, is about 1.6 percent increase. So 1.6 million dollar. 1.6 percent increase. Six percent increase. You think. Right. Which should sound re, uh, where I would expect right. it with salaries and benefits. Right. Yeah. So. I will add that to that report. Great idea. Any questions by the board for Becky? 
Okay, so at our next meeting, we will actually have an action item to consider the adoption Correct. of this budget. Correct. And uh, if there's no further questions from the board on this material, I turn now to the public hearing. I don't believe that we need to take a vote to go into a public hearing. We'll simply adjourn I to a public hearing. I actually think we have to adjourn the meeting, call it to order again, take the roll again and have the public hearing, and I, then adjourn the public hearing. Oh, adjourn over. the committee of the whole meeting and go yeah. into Well, I specifically went online to look at this because I wasn't sure myself, and according to what I read, you don't need to get a vote, but, you know, it's six of one, half a dozen another. So uh, I will propose a motion that we adjourn our committee of the whole to go into public media, to public hearing and uh, to reconvene in a regular me meeting following the public hearing. And uh, any second to that? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? None opposed, thank you. We will now proceed to the public hearing. This is an important aspect because it gives folks in the community an opportunity to pose written and oral questions and concerns of the budget for this coming year and we leave it open to anybody in the audience to approach the podium and and speak on the budgetary process and we'll give everybody a few moments to collect their thoughts and if there's no questions from the public regarding the budget process or the data that was given by Becky. Um, I suspect that we will be able to close the public hearing on the 1415 budget. That being said, we will now reconvene into our regular meeting. Are we at 7:25? We're at 7:25. Should we take five? We'll start take the regular five. meeting as posted. I mean, it's yeah. 20 minutes. I'd say no. But. Yeah, we'll wait. Okay. That, that's a good idea. Thanks. We'll take five. Everybody back? Okay. Bob, you there? Yes, I am. Okay. So we will uh, resume our, our board meeting tonight, and we always start every board meeting with the opportunity to take public comments. And uh, these public comments are timed, and they are to be, we ask of folks to make any comments uh, on a non-actionable item that's on the current budget. Uh, there will be plenty of opportunity to speak on actionable items at that time. So if there's anybody who'd like to come forward and uh, make a statement during the public comment portion, uh, please feel free. Hello. Board, I know some of your faces. I want to let you know I'm a parent of a fifth grader and he's been in D64 since he was in kindergartener with some great experiences. And he switched to uh, a different D64 school for grade four. He's currently there in grade five. Um, I'm talking to you today because I would like to see if there is some sort of a parent grievance procedure that could be instituted for parents who have a grievance with placement of their children, um, if they feel it's inequitable or not, um, when their channels through the school have been exhausted, which means when they have gone to the uh, internal staff of the school, such as the principal. Um, that's what's happening in my case. My son had a new teacher in grade four, and he was new to the school. And she was new, and she also was um, her first year teaching. And it seemed to me that a new student to a new school would be best served with experienced teachers who knew the other children and the parents and the culture of the school. However, um, out of great regard for the principal at the time, um, it, was, it was agreed that he would stay put and that we would see how the fit went. It, it, it wasn't optimal, it was not an optimal year, and it was piggybacked upon the fact that in grade two, he also had a brand new teacher who 
was a brand new teacher to the field and also did not stay, or she did not stay in the school. This teacher he had in grade four is currently continuing to be a teacher at Washington. So he had two new teachers out of three years as a D64 student, and I believe that neither of those two years provided him with an optimal education because I do believe that when all other things are equal, experience is more desirable over those who have a lack of experience. The principal and I discussed in a couple of meetings last year about his situation with the new teacher and um, she had given me assurances he would not again receive a new teacher for grade five. Um, there's some semantics going back and forth. He has again received a new teacher. The semantics are whether the teacher is new or not new because this particular teacher he has is new to Washington, is new to teaching fifth graders, and is new to the CFC program. Um, so whether or not one chooses to regard her as new or not new is up to one's individual um, wording. However, we can agree on the fact that the teacher is inexperienced in teaching grade five CFC students. Um, I therefore feel since he's two years at the school, and both years he's had a new teacher, that this is an inequitable placement, and I think that it would be nice if there was a grievance procedure in place in case as he goes on to middle school, he is to yet receive another new teacher. Because at some point, the parents need to have somewhere to go, other than just saying, I think this is unfair, which is what's happening in my case. Um, the responses I got as to why he was not switched were that he, um, all of his students, all of the students who were with the former grade four C of C teacher have now been placed in with the new C of C teacher. However, that is not correct. Many of the students who were with the prior grade four C of C teacher are now with the experienced grade five C of C teacher, which is where I had requested him to be placed. I had also been told that the policies that he cannot be switched when school has started. However, this is patently unfair because parents have no way to know what their child's placement is until the school year has already started. So it seems to me that that policy is, um, it's shut down at the get-go. Um, I also want to point out that when I feel that my uh, request to have him switched, my complaint really, um, really was an opportunity to open up a dialogue on what happens if there is perhaps a missed placement with a child, as I feel there was with my child. Um, but instead of that conversation happening, a team of six or more people was assembled to discuss my son and how he fits in at the school. And I thought that was wholly inappropriate and out of place because I think that this conversation is separate from the unique student himself. It had just had to do, to my mind, with an internal issue of inequitable placement. So I would like to know, please, as we go forward, that the board just keeps in mind that it would be nice if somewhere down the line um, parents can have some sort of recourse. And I don't know if it's in the bylaws or how it works. I really don't. This is spur of the moment. It's actually my son's birthday today. So I'm going to rush home and host some more family members and more cake. And I'm going to do that now. And I thank you for your time. And um, just want to keep that in mind. And I hope that I'm not back here again with a new teacher for him, which will be um, instead of uh, three out of four years, if he gets another new teacher next year, it would be four out of five years. And that's not acceptable. I don't think that's the best that District 64 has to offer. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, we do have your contact information, right? Yeah. We have your contact. OK, great. Um, I, I'm not familiar with every last little bit of policy that we have in our policy handbook, but um, offhand, are you aware of any um, policy regarding um, grievance or appeal? No, not based on class placement. Okay. Well, um, suffice to say that we have a uniform grievance procedure. Um, a parent can always, I assume Dr. Hines, contact you with they feel that you know they have tried to work with a school principal and not been able to, you know, get what they need. Um, so you know, there I imagine conversations a parent can have, uh, you know, 
if they don't feel satisfied with the result within their individual school. Yeah, right? I think some of those conversations have taken place over the past few days. Okay. And, and I would imagine that uh, you'll have continuing conversation to whatever means are necessary. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? And not, yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll need to come up here if you want to make a comment, though. Nice to have a face and a name. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you all. Um, I actually was just following up on what you just mentioned. You just mentioned that that was discussed three days ago, if there was a problem with a principal or something going on, and as far as um, how, what kind of grievance or what other, did you just mention something like that? Didn't you? Just when, I'm not when, sure what you're. Way to address. Well, p parents typically, if there's a problem, they start out with the classroom teacher, then they go to the principal, then it, sometimes they'll talk to one of the assistant superintendents, and sometimes it comes to me. So that is typically how it kind of unfolds. But conversations without getting into particular family situations have, have taken place for a number of days. And I would imagine so at the beginning just, of the year, there's sure. all kinds of conversations coming. Sure. Right. Okay. I just was asking if there was anything um, to elaborate on that, because I didn't. Those are private conversations right, between families and the superintendent, families and principals. That's really not something that we would discuss here. Oh, no, right I wasn't tip. asking you to yeah. discuss anything privately. I was just, I, I thought that right now that you were discussing something publicly. So. No. Any, all right, thank Typically you. after a public comment, we don't really often engage for these reasons. We'll do something at a later time. So we were just following up to a question that was asked, but no problem. typically we don't. Yes, thanks. Any further comments? And not seeing any, uh, Dr. Hines, opening days of school. It's hard to believe we're in week three. I can't believe it. Um, but after an exciting Institute Day, we began the 2014-15 school year. It was a beautiful day. We had over 4,400 students um, show up with smiles, uh, some sleep in their eyes. But for the most part, they looked pretty excited. Uh, transportation, as uh, Ms. Allard and Mr. Mackle uh, shared, Ran very smoothly. We have a new bus company, as you know, and um, we couldn't believe what a what a great uh, first day we had in terms of getting all of our students to school on time. Um, I was able to visit all the schools. The facilities looked impeccable. So our uh, hats off to our custodial staff. The teachers worked very very hard getting their classrooms ready and inviting to get kids excited about the school year. So the halls looked wonderful. Um, I was able to visit the schools. There were assemblies going on. Uh, a lot of kind of get to know you activities and um, I sent uh, Mrs. Warden some pictures. There were Chromebooks being used on that very first day of school. So kids really just, and teachers as well, um, dove right in and got, got down to business. Um, as you know, Roosevelt uh, really earned their stripes on day one. They had rolling brownouts and uh, a small fire, as you know, in the attic. The fire department was called. They evacuated on day one. Um, didn't even have an opportunity to practice their first fire drill, so it was been a baptism by firestorm. Very proud of the staff and the students. Um, thankfully, it was a beautiful day. They were outside for a little over an hour, and I will report at a later time the cause and the, what we've done to um, rectify the situation that, that tripped the fire alarm. Um, throughout the opening weeks, there have been different picnics and parties, back to school night events at the different schools. Washington's having a PTA meeting tonight, so the PTA meetings are in full swing. Um, so again, week three, and already a lot has happened. But uh, as a whole, very successful start, and I'm proud of staff, families, students. It seems like we're up and running. It's been exciting. I would just like to say that the communication has been excellent um, to the board on some of the issues that you've had, and also as a parent as to what's going on with the school, from the principals and from um, administration. And I actually got a comment that um, having you in the building was really noticed and it was a real positive thing. Um, regarding that uh, Roosevelt situation, apparently there was supposed to be a disconnected sensor or something or other, and I know that a, a review of other buildings was carried out so that this is not replicated. Um, got the green light on that? Everything's good? Wait, take it or do you want to take it? 
Genesee, you want to? I'll, I'll be I'll be happy to do that. Yes, we have surveyed all the buildings um, within the district to find any abandoned controls, motor starters, anything that was kind of abandoned over from from other projects. We have identified about thirty of those items throughout the district. And uh, we are in the process right now. Well, we will start Thursday uh, with Genesis Electric to disconnect those, remove them, and cap all the wiring. And they're, they're all disconnected now. <laughs> so power has been killed to all of them. So we won't have any more issues. During the brownout, it was just a control board and a starter motor that, that, that burned because of low voltage. And it caused some smoke and enough to set the fire alarm. <coughs> there was never any danger, but certainly a, a major inconvenience. But the, yeah, we are on top of that, and that will all be rectified. I would say it'd be about two weeks of work uh, to go through and get all of those things just uh, removed. They are not, they are now all currently disconnected. I'd also like to make a comment about the Roosevelt staff. Uh, in an emergency like that, on a very first day, without any body having time to take a deep breath or even get comfortable in their rooms, to have an emergency like that occur on the very first day and to handle it with such precision. And, and with efficiency um, goes a long ways toward really, uh, it's gratifying to know that we have that level of competence uh, when it comes to the safety of our children. So I want to commend the staff uh, for above and beyond the call of duty on the very first day to be able to hit the ground running, so to speak. So uh, congratulations to them. Um, next item since you're sitting in the hot seat. Uh, we had a uh, discussion at our last board meeting that uh, was quite thorough. And I'm hoping that you'll bring a little bit more information to us tonight. I will do that. And we'll start doing that by introducing to you Nick Papa Nicholas Jr. is with Nicholas and Associates and he is our construction manager for the project. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm just gonna let him take it. And if uh, there's any questions that you have for either one of us, please feel free to ask. Welcome, Nick. Good evening. Well, uh, thank you uh, for considering and bringing Nicholas and Associates on board. I'll give you a little background on, on ourselves. We represent 24 school districts locally. Uh, many of your neighboring districts uh, have been long-term clients of ours. It's a family-owned and operated business. My father started it in the mid-'70s. And I got brothers, sisters, aunts, cousins, all sorts of us over there. 90% uh, of our work is public K-12. So from a project management uh, site superintendent standpoint, the public uh, educational world is what we all live in. We understand students and staff and programs come first. We're there to support uh, your facilities and work around your programs and students and staff and ultimately deliver uh, an end result safely and efficiently, uh, which is kind of why we're here now. Uh, you've had a long-standing mechanical issue uh, that we're getting involved with, and we've been happy to tour the facilities with staff, and we're going to get this thing fixed for you very, in a very quick, efficient manner. Effie Moran is a, is a contractor that performs probably 10 to $15 million in mechanical work for us annually. Uh, we're just coming off Deerfield uh, Public School District 109, about a $15 million VRF project with Effie Moran. So we're very, very familiar with their management staff, all of their suppliers, all of their vendors. The site superintendent we're gonna utilize for your project lives in Park Ridge. He's been in Deerfield for the last three years. And so every day at three o'clock, he's going to be at your school implementing the work, checking off 200 and some remedial items that have to be corrected and really follow through with it and take it to the next level of completion. You know, what we've found over the years is contractors by nature need a leader. A mechanical contractor sometimes doesn't make the best prime contractor because they don't know how to get resolution and bring things to a close. So not to say that we're the hammer over everybody, but we know how to take a list and follow through with every single item till it's complete and ultimately the board and the district gets a, uh, a mechanical system that you paid a lot of money for operating the way that you expected it to. Now with that being said, there may be some value added items that we come across, but that's after all of the test and balance is done. It's after all the controls are operating. So the Farnsworth report was great. I mean that really 
brought us up to speed because a lot has transpired over the last year. And you know, for us to know every single conversation and every every single submittal and shop drawing and why things uh, were installed the way they were, that was very important to us. Um, so what we're now going to do is implement the completion of those items, uh, and that's going to start a week from today. We'll have Mike again. The gentleman's name is Mike Doherty. And he's our, again, on-site superintendent, and he'll be on-site every day until the project's completed, both on the air side and on the heating side. So that's kind of it as an overview. I'd be happy to answer any questions more specific to what we do. I, I suspect there was a meeting. I don't suspect there was a meeting. I know yeah. there was a meeting um, between uh, the architects, Fanning Howie, Effie Moran, couple of other folks, yourself, our staff. Um, what, what, what's the status of that? What was the end result of that meeting? Was there good cooperation? Everybody pulling the oars in the same direction? Uh, was there acceptance of the information in that report? Or was there uh, dismissal of the information in that report? How, what was the, the outcome of that? Yeah, thanks for asking, Dr. Brelli. We had a meeting, I, I think I sent you guys the list of everybody that was there. You know. It, it, it couldn't have gone any better. I mean, everybody was at the table, everybody was up front, everybody was saying, you know what, we, we owe these people this project. Um, it, it couldn't have been any more positive. I started the meeting out, you know, with, with introducing everyone as, as the solution to the issue. Um, you know, not looking to place blame, not looking to, to point fingers, working as a team to provide a solution to bring this system up. And it went extremely well. It, it, it sometimes it got a little detailed, um, you know, with, with some information, but everybody was there and it, it, it really couldn't have gone any better. And, and as Nick can comment too, he has done a lot of work with F.E. Moran in the, ba in, in the past and, and in the recent uh, past as well. And, and, and they're on board. I mean, everybody's on board. So I, I really don't anticipate any issues, uh, you know. Anything can happen, but it was very, very positive. Well, the, the one issue that I'm concerned about is, I, I believe, based on what you just said, everybody's working together, everybody wants to rectify this. What is the timeline? Because that is necessary. Because how does it impact our students and staff? And what, so what are we looking at time frame wise? And I imagine you got to get something done before it gets too cold to check some of the systems. So yeah, I'll jump in. What we've done or are in the process of doing is taking the complete list of remedial action items and assigning a time frame to it. Um, every item will have the task, will have a, the duration, and ultimately a completion date. So that's what, again, you're engaging us to do is execute that and make sure it's done in a timely manner. I was very clear to Effie Moran, if we weren't getting, uh, you know, uh, completion dates honored and fulfilled, that we're going to look to fulfill them because we know the people that can fulfill them. They can do it. I, they're one of the largest mechanical contractors in Chicago. They're a very reputable company. They're not going to run for anything. But as I sit here today, the one advantage that, you know, on our experience side is Deerfield uh, Public Schools was one of the larger VRF systems installed in the last two, three, four, or five years. It's a newer technology. I'd be lying to say if it didn't, we didn't have to work out kinks on, on the heating side and the cooling side. We're fortunate enough to have the team members that work hand in hand with staff and all the equipment manufacturers so they know the things and the pitfalls and the, and the adjustments and the different set points, just the whole integration of the system. And so that's what uh, Nicholas and our relationships brings to the table and all of my team members that were on that project are going to be the ones on this project and just and just execute it. And so, you know, Moran, they will respond. You're, we're not going to have an issue because contractually, they can't fail. I mean, there's a performance bond in place. Nobody wants to start calling bonding companies. Nobody wants to go the legal route on that. And I don't, we're not even close to that yet. So, and if we do sense that's going to go that way, we're just going to, again, execute from the contractual language the completion times that we're telling them they have to fulfill, and if they don't, we'll bring in the right people to do it. What, what is the end point, though? What, what date are you planning on? Well, we're, it's a double-edged sword because we need some cold weather in order to make sure the heating side of it is completely working. In the next four weeks, we're going to have the system 100% operational, test and balanced, all the controls integrated, so we're going to know 
how it's responding and is, is it, you know, is there other building issues that have to be identified on why the system isn't operating. After our, our couple days that we've surveyed it, read through all the documents, I think the system's going to operate. I'm more, I more than think it's gonna operate. I know it's gonna operate because the VRF system is a good system. It just needs to be the integration from the LG controls because there's integral controls and without boring you, I, and I, I watched the last board meeting so I know everybody discussed the uh, Farnsworth uh, report at length. The LG system and the, in your case, Delta control system there's a learning curve on the control side how to get those two things to communicate and talk to one another. There's a lot of commands being uh, pushed over bandwidth and they get rejected and then nothing works and everybody throws their hands up. Well, that's where we're getting involved and everything we learned at Deerfield, we're gonna implement here for you. So to answer your question, in the next four weeks, you'll have a system working. Thank you. I assure you. Thank you. Any, any questions from the board for Scott? Or Nick. Thank you. Okay. Next topic on our agenda is the 2015 school board election outreach. Seems like we just had an election and additions to our board, but time marches on. And uh, April of 2015 will be another election. The uh, sequence is that normally in September of the year before, which would be about now, the packets had normally become available. Interested folks would pick up the packets. They had until sometime in December. They, had, they were delivered back to the uh, district uh, headquarters. I remember it was a first come, first serve, and whoever got it in first, their name was first on the ballot, and, and on it went. Um, I must have slept in that day because my name was last on the ballot So, when I ran. Um, but the, the long and the short of it is, it's a new system now. Uh, the district is not going to uh, be compiling packets and folks won't be coming to district headquarters and dropping things off. Uh, it all is uh, funneled now through the uh, Cook County uh, clerk and I went to the website today and I had a nice conversation with Bernadette to just kind of cross the T's and dot the I's. Um, let me just pull this stuff up. And when you go to the new, and I called the Cook County Clerk's Office too, and she told me basically just go to the website. But you go to the main website and you'll see the home page and then there's a, a tab called Election Suburban Cook County, and you do the drop down on that, and you go to 2015 elections, which I understand was just posted today. Uh, once you go to there on 2015 elections, the uh, sheet will look something like this, and um, it's, it starts off with the 2015 election information, but it's speaking of the February elections, you have to go down to the April elections, and under that, you'll see another sheet that looks like this, and under that it says Candidate's Guide. And then when you click on that, you'll see a front sheet that looks like this. That, however, when you open it, is this. And it is 90 pages of wonderful reading and rules and things that you have to follow now to submit an application to run for the Board of Education. Now, it, I haven't gone through this. I literally printed this off today. I haven't had time to even begin to read this. Uh, it would be my hope that we can somehow consolidate this down and make some reasonableness out of this. There's, there's got to be a way to streamline this for interested folks, give them bullet points to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, I imagine things still remain the same. You know, there'll be the economic interest, there's the petitions, there's how to file the petitions, all that stuff, where it all has to go but it's gonna take a little bit of time to go through this because it truly is a brand new system as to how uh, it's gonna be conducted this year. Now, what isn't new, um, you in your packets, you have some information that uh, things that are provided by the district for interested candidates. Uh, one of those items would be the open house that is attended by active Board of uh, Education members uh, older members are in only two, I, yeah, yeah, 
by the uh, open meeting or by the, by any meeting, we can we can't have a quorum, so only two members can be there. But that is often attended by uh, uh, past members and past presidents to give anybody who is interested in running a little idea of what the time commitment is and what the rules responsibilities are for being a member of the Board of Education. Um, there'll also be information posted on our website, as much information as we can provide them, direction, linkage, uh, links to this information on the web and such. Um, and of course, any other outreach that any members of the board uh, would feel would be helpful to anybody who wants to run for this. Um, now, this coming election, I know that myself, John, and Dan, the three of us, will be open. And uh, there will be three four-year positions open and one two-year position uh, for the election that will be held in April of 2015. So uh, that's the report. And while we have more information, when I have a few moments to start reading through this, perhaps I can deliver to you an executive summary and kind of slim it down a little bit. And is the board interested in doing an ABC, the school board service? We, we put an old memo in, a flyer, so we can work on getting a date on the calendar. And Yeah, I would highly suggest mm -hmm. you do it. We okay. started doing this after the caucus that used to nominate for this district right. dissolved. Okay. And uh, there was kind of a perceived need to have some way to reach out to people who were interested. I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, and the first date that petitions are available uh, to go uh, is canvassing, or 9-23. So we still have uh, approximately two weeks or so. And when's the election? Uh, April 7th. Thank you. Okay. Um, Joel? If you can... Uh, on our next item is the policy for uh, central office hiring. If you can kind of walk us through that. Stop smiling. Good evening. Um, I'm here to talk to the board tonight about the uh, seeking the new chief school business official for the 15-16 school years. We know Ms. Allard is retiring at the end of the school year. We will miss Becky greatly. Um, but with everything, these processes seem to become earlier and earlier in the year. And we're at the point now where we'd like to start moving forward with the discussions with the Board of Education about setting the parameters and the time frames for replacing Ms. Allard uh, for the next school year. And you'll see before you tonight a memo which is just a brief outline of some of the steps. We also have, uh, thanks to Becky, um, a packet from the Association of School Business Officials of Illinois that has a nice little handy guide that very much we found is a useful tool in setting out the steps as we look to move forward for finding a replacement. And just if we go down the steps very quickly, um, I'm sure Becky would agree with me that over the years, the role and tasks of the chief financial officer for the district have changed dramatically and in the future are looking to change even more and we'd like to have discussions about where we think the position is going and what that might mean for us for seeking a candidate as we move into this changing world of uh, education and finance. We would want to speak with the board about that as well as step two which would be determine the appropriate title moving forward, the salary range and then obviously the qualifications that go with that. Uh, we would look to do that in a closed session sometime maybe around the 22nd of this month, if possible, if that works. If not, we could do it a little later. We'll be working with Ms. Allard and uh, Superintendent myself to update the job description. And then we would move forward with um, getting our specific timeline in place at that point, putting our job postings out, and then obviously with the interview process, and then coming back with a candidate to the Board of Education. Um, we expect this to be about a two to three month probably process. Um, in an ideal world, we'd like to have a candidate before the board 
somewhere, if possible, before the holiday season. Uh, what we've found a little bit more in speaking with Becky, who's intimate in this process in her years in the field, has been that uh, the process begins early, that there are always districts that um, are moving faster and faster and finding qualified people out there who are willing to move. Um, takes a little bit of time, but you also need to start early to get the best people. And so we'd like to begin that process here now. Um, we, particularly, as I said, on September 22nd, possibly, and really get the ball rolling in October. And that's kind of a very brief outline of where we'd like to, what we'd like to do and kind of how we'd like to do it. Um, to start. Joel, I have a, a one comment and uh, I guess one question. Uh, regarding step one, where you want to do a review and ideally what the board with Im administration input, uh, what we would like this role to look like going forward. Obviously, Becky will have some input and I imagine lots of things have evolved over the years. And Becky, from, from where you are today, from where you are when you started just a few short years ago, uh, I, I imagine your position is considerably different. And I, I imagine going forward, it's, it's going to continue to, to be different. And I think that conversation is important. But Joel, you mentioned that, and, and that conversation basically would be not talking about a specific individual. That, that conversation would be talking about a position, uh, uh, the kinds of uh, activities we want that person to engage in, and reporting, and, and all those kinds of things. I, I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned that we should have that discussion in a closed session, and I'm wondering why that would not be a good opportunity to have that conversation in an open session. Um, only because I think as long as we're not talking about a specific individual, it gives folks in the community an idea of, of the, role, the responsibilities and the roles that the person who is arguably governing the finance or directing the finance um, uh, is uh, where they're coming from and where they're going to be. So I, I just wonder if you can, you know, if you have, if you, if you have any thoughts on that. No, I, I would uh, defer to the board's judgment and if they prefer to have that conversation in public and or private, um, I would expect that we would probably have the discussion of comparable salaries and things in closed, and I assume since that may influence our discussion, we may have that in closed also or parts thereof. Um, but by no means would I assume that it could not happen in open session also. Okay. And the other thing I thought of was uh, hiring times. Um, when do you feel would be the best time to, you, you would like to have this project start in October. I imagine you'd like to have the project completed by somewhere February, March. When would, how much overlap would you need for this position? Um, I know that when Dr. Heinz started, there was a tremendous amount, way more than I ever I anticipated. Uh, for her to get acclimated to the district, uh, and she put in tremendous hours on her own above and beyond the measly 10 days that we thought would be necessary. Um, what would be necessary for the finance position? Would that be a similar amount of time, or do you anticipate more than that? You know, I'll defer a little bit to Becky on that, as she's done some of these in the past. I would assume anybody, you know, part of it's going to depend on the individual that we hire, the experience uh -huh. they have, the similarity in district size, budget uh, size, the amount of, um, is going to be crucial in the amount of overlap and time. Um, I would assume there would be time needed. My immediate reaction is until I know who the individual is, I may not have the right answer, but would you want to take a guess? I would agree with you, Joel, on that. There should be some crossover. Yes. Um, this is the seventh district I've worked in in 37 years. And um, I typically show up on July 1 and figure it out myself. So, and I don't think that's always best for the district. So I think whoever you hire, um, depending on what district they're currently working for, I would hope that there could be an arrangement to do some per diem days. Are you thinking like three to five would work? Three or? to five, I yeah. think, would be adequate. It's because they're going to do much, a lot of work on their own and a lot of research on their own. Right. And um, certainly 
through um, conversations. I have, I have a very large network in this profession, and I'm sure whoever you should hire, uh, there'll be multiple conversations going on all the time. And I think from a hiring perspective, we would actually, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. Martin, we're thinking maybe before the winter break, we would love to have this all um, signed, sealed, and delivered. Because if we're going to move on a veteran, we, there's a handful of good ones out there, several of which I'm already courting, that you know we want to see if they'll move sooner than later so nobody else gets them. And if that were to be the scenario, then... Were the, would there be options or time set aside that, I mean, now you have a six-month window that you can do an assimilation process uh, slowly over, over that six-month period of time uh, and incorporate that, those five days during those five or six months? I think that will be a conversation that whoever the candidate is yeah. and Dr. Hines, that we make that decision. It, it really depends on what district they're coming from. They're coming from a small district where they have very limited staff. They may not be able to give up that time. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, that's a big question mark on um, how we will do it and what that, that will look like. Okay. All right. If I may, I wanted to clarify a couple of things uh, about the process and just make sure I understand them right. So if, what you would like to do is have a conversation about steps one and two. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to be sure that we do is kind of respect our governance model of the idea that we hire as a board one person and that is our superintendent and our superintendent hires the business manager uh, or whatever we choose to call the position. Um, I assume, Dr. Hines, that you'll have some recommendations or some outline of what you would like to see step one and two and perhaps have some targeted areas where you'd like our input rather than just kind of a general so board, what would you like the role to be kind of discussion, right? Yes, definitely. We will put some teeth to this and, and put our heads together, Joel and I. This was a great document that Becky shared. Joel and I have had some conversations, but we'll sit down and really fine tune this. So there's a very clear kind of month by month process that we're gonna follow. Okay, and then yeah. my other question in a similar vein is just to understand near the end of the process as well. I'm assuming, at least the way that it's always been done in the past for administrators other than the superintendent, is that the board will not interview the candidates, but rather the superintendent and whoever else the superintendent assembles, perhaps with a board member or two in a liaison role, will interview, uh, ultimately, Dr. Hines, you'll make the selection and then present that person for board approval. I think right? I would like a board member to participate just based on how you know, intimately involved you are with the budget, and it's one of your main areas of oversight, but I think you know, I would look for a volunteer to, to serve at some point during that interview process. Typically, how we did it with the Director of Technology and Innovation position, um, you sat in on one of the larger group interviews, and like everyone gave their consultative feedback to us, and then we used all that information um, to move forward with candidates. So um, my thoughts are similar to John's in the sense that, yeah, I, I want it to be Dr. Hyde's choice. I don't want it to be ours. You can get direction from us, and but we're, we select one person, and I think we've done a nice job there. And, and Tony's comments um, as far as versus open versus closed, I, I would, don't see why we wouldn't do it in open. I, I, for what it's worth, I think that Dr. Heinz has to make this decision, make a recommendation to the board, but I also think it's important that this board do some long-range planning for this position and, and identify where this position is going to go down the road. I think that's our job. I think our job is to look way down the road, and the day-to-day -day operations are absolutely left up to Dr. Heinz. So I, I think that conversation that we have on the roles, responsibilities, and, and position that that person who fills that job, that, that role, uh, actually what they do and, and, and what, what component, what capacity they will help lead this district. That's, that's going to be a very interesting conversation. Yeah, and I guess I would say, I mean, you and I may disagree just a little bit on that. You know, I, I see the organization of the team as Dr. Heinz's job. And the, you know, and therefore I see the, the role of the chief school business officer as primarily a superintendent's decision. Certainly happy to provide input on that. And uh, I'm sure, you know, Dr. Heinz, like any good superintendent, will keep an ear out for the, you know, 
the temperature of the board on these things. But I, you know, at least from my perspective, that's not a decision I expect to make. Yeah, I'm just so I understand. So at the end of the day, in simple terms, you're going to come to us looking for advice, not permission, right? You're going to come to us and say, "Here's some thoughts I have. Give me some feedback." But not, "May I do this?" Because I, I'm with the, I'm with most of you guys. I don't think we should be telling you what to do. I would agree. Okay, but I do want to hear what you have to say, and I'm very curious on give you any feedback you need. Oh yes, we'll we'll keep you you know in the loop on this because it is a big hire. So. Okay, leads us to our first action item, and that's uh, I don't think we've ever gone this long into a meeting without an action item. Um, but the uh, consent agenda, uh, does anybody have any comments on the uh, consent agenda? Any? Uh... Uh, yes, Bob, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, this is probably more for Becky, uh, but in the, the list of like all the vendor payments, there's pages and pages of payments that list the vendors, BMO Financial Group, and I'm assuming maybe that's just a checking account. Um, BMO Financial is our procurement card program, and so that's when we pay a vendor, we pay BMO, and typically we're the staff that are authorized to have a P card um, then are listed under the description in the invoice. So it's a credit card program. But VM, BMO Financial is the vendor that we are paying. Becky, in the invoice description, uh, do those entries have the ultimate vendor in them? Correct. Way? If you look at the first entry, the four imprint um, or T-shirts that we purchased. Um, so handwrite, four, the four vendor is the vendor right, there. right, right. Okay. So if Amazon, Museum of Science and Industry, Teaching Strategies, Lakeshore Learning, the vendor is listed in each one of those line items. And the initials are the staff member that made the purchase. Is that okay, Bob? Uh, yeah, it's a little garbled sometimes hearing, but uh, if everybody else is fine, that, that I, I'm okay. I just, uh, I guess I just didn't understand it. Should we repeat it, those of us that are a little closer than Becky that are... So the vendor item is the, it's like the third column, the one right to the right of it that says invoice description is your vendor. So if you're on page two, where it says BMO Financial Group LL4 imprints, that's the vendor we used for the t-shirts to the tune of $213.42. Right, so, so my, my question just isn't, and maybe it's the garment part, I just didn't hear as well. So why, why is it always BMO Financial It's the credit card company that we use. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just, I just, you know, I just wonder if that, you know, does that make it difficult for us to identify, you know, who we're paying? Or I, I understand that it shows here, but if at some point you were ever trying to accumulate information on, you know, who you're making payments to, if you're just looking at vendors, it's BMO Financial is going to be a, you know, represent a lot of actual, I realize it may not be large expenses, but represent uh, a myriad of different folks that you wouldn't see yeah. them. Yeah, I think the, qu the, the question that should be asked, Becky, is, it, and that's very good, it's like a, getting your credit card bill every month, mm -hmm. and I make a payment to Chase, but right. you open up the invoice and it's got all the breakdown there. So is it possible for the district with the computerized programs that you have to do exactly what Bob just asked? We would sort on BMO Financial because that's who the check was issued to. And we would not be able to make a quick accumulation to each one of those individual vendors. So it, it would take some time then? It would take um, a very long time. I know that there's some programs, uh, Quicken for one, that has the ability of doing some of this collating for you. I'm not suggesting that we go to Quicken, but is there any way, 
and, and again, I think it's a pretty good idea to, to look at, to, to break down and collate some of these expenses over the course of a year. Is there a way to group these into different categories or, or, or individually, or is there a better way to, to stratify these? The, again, the, the vendor is listed, and this is what we're required to report on, who we wrote a check to. That's BMO Financial. Um, we provide the amount of detail um, next to that so that you can see, instead of just writing general supplies or ground supplies or maintenance supplies, which wouldn't give you, the board, and or the community the information as to what vendor we're spending on, we provide that detail in that description of the invoice. But let's say at the end of the year, I wanted to know how much we paid BMO Financial for T-shirts. And, you know, there, would there be any way to, to collate that? No, I would have to pull out each one of these paper um, reports that we provide you every board meeting that you approve bills and go through with a highlighter and start highlighting things. It would be very labor intensive. Becky, this yeah. gets down into the weeds just a little bit. Yes, but, it does. Um, if you were to recode the way you do the description, so right now you lead with the initials of the person who made the purchase, then you put the vendor name in, then you put in a description. If you were to reverse that and put the name of the vendor as the very first text in the description line, then in theory, you could say total up the Amazon purchases at the end of the year because you could total up all the invoices to BMO Financial for which the description begins with the word Amazon. Um, you know, John, actually, my guess is your vendor for this software system would be able to give you a customized report where you said enter a yeah. vendor name and it will look through all your vendors and add those up and then it will go through and do a keyword search based on some variables and you can customize with them to just go through the descriptions and add those in as well and give you a separate report. Every GL vendor I've ever seen in my life will produce a specialized report for you if you'd like it. My guess is it could be pretty quick. Well, I don't even think we'd have to pay for it now that I'm thinking yeah. about this. If this were, and this is downloadable into Excel. Right. So if you use that feature, text uh, and separate that yeah. particular column um, into right. where you have it separated after the hyphen, we probably could quickly do that. But again, it would take some time to do. But you know, like I said, a customized report because they'll look for things like not make sig you know uppercase and lowercase, and they'll look for special characters. But I mean, honestly, I've seen these reports in GL systems time and time again. It, it probably wouldn't be more than you know a thousand or two thousand dollars for the vendor to create something like this. So if it ever comes that we would need it in the future, my guess is we could solve the problem in an automated fashion reasonably well down the road. So I wouldn't. I don't. I mean, I can see it as a concern, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't lose sleep over it actually. My guess is they can do it because we—I know I've done it personally. So, yeah. and for the most part, we're talking about smaller purchases. Very small purchases. So, I mean, I, I guess we've talked about it, but what really, what is the necessity of, of doing that? Is it, it? We're talking not that big of a deal, right? Well, again, I think I could download this into um, Excel and just separate that column. So, yeah. if anybody wanted to know how much I spend on Amazon, yeah, yeah, I could okay. quickly calculate it. Okay. Okay. Any other questions regarding consent agenda? And if not, I will need a motion. I move that the Board of Education of Community Consolidated School District 64, Park Ridge, Niles, Illinois, approve the consent agenda of September 8, 2014, which includes the personnel report, bills, and approval of environ contract renewal. Second? Second. All right, starting uh, with John. Hi. Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 And Bob? Aye. Okay. Seven nothing. Uh, next item, board member liaison report. We have an upcoming meeting where we will be sitting with uh, ISBA uh, Barb Tony, talking about superintendent evaluations and committees. Uh, that will be 18th. two 18th, yes. I was going to say two weeks, but it's less. Yeah, it's less. Um, but as far as uh, uh, tonight's meeting goes, uh, there's no reports for the lazy on. That is correct. Okay. Uh, other discussions? So upcoming agenda, as Dr. Borelli just said, Barb Tony will be here. I sent her the draft um, tool that I created um, back in July, which seems like an eternity ago. And um, 
question that I have for you, would you like me to send it electronically to each of you prior to the 18th so you have a fresh copy I was able to plug in um, based on the roadmap where some of the metrics or ways in which we'll measure our areas of focus will fit within those categories? Yes. All right, so I'll email that out tomorrow. Okay, um, so that'll be on the 18th and it is going to begin um, at 7 o'clock and it will be at the um, ESC. We then have another board meeting on the 22nd. This agenda is um, somewhat in draft formed as the AC group met today to finalize the agenda. And uh, so Madeline will get a, a slightly revised version of this copy out to you um, tomorrow. You have a couple uh, memoranda of information, one from Joel regarding the merit pay update. Since you're sitting so close, Joel, would you like to just walk the board through quickly what you've been up to in terms of meeting with the secretarial uh, staff at each building? Sorry about that. Uh, since our last meeting, I've been going out and uh, begin the process of meeting with our secretarial and custodial groups. Uh, met with the custodial council, met with uh, several building secretarial groups and the administrators of those buildings together, where we have begun to review and talk about the tool and the steps moving forward, talk about the board's desire to implement the process uh, of continuing to meet and discuss the tool uh, to make sure we're progressing creating interrelated reliability, making sure we're having no issues, um, and putting in place a process for us through the course of the year to have discussions so that we can present uh, not only feedback upon ourselves to see if we can't continue to tweak the process to make it better, but also so at the end of the year we can provide the Board of Education uh, with a very thorough report of how the system has gone from both the administrative and the employee perspective and we can provide any recommendations and or ask any or answer any questions the board may have at the end of the 2014-15 school year. And there's Joel, a big unknown. Oh, sorry, Tony. Go ahead. I was going to say, Joel, how many meetings do you anticipate having with those groups? Currently or through the course Throughout of the year? Through the course of the year. Um, I plan on having probably officially about four, three to four meetings. I say that we have a midway point for the secretarial, which is a given. We plan on having meetings prior to that. We've started, but we're going to have some follow-ups prior to that, and then we'll probably do another one after. With our um, custodial group, their evaluation process is a little more um, detailed in the time frames because of just how the seasons break and the different cleaning stages that happen, summer, fall, winter. Uh, so I anticipate a meeting at the end of each one of those evaluation cycles. Uh, with those groups, so which will also be three or four meetings. They'll just be at different times of the year. Great. Great. All right, next you have a memo, uh, an MOI regarding the math uh, adoption survey that uh, Dr. Lopez submitted to you. As you've heard me say before, she's worked very hard um, with the, not only for the adoption, hold the whole process last year. Um, in the spring, they, the staff was asked to complete a survey that would provide some uh, data in terms of how the <coughs> staff would need to work in the summer and then into next year to further refine the delivery of the new math curriculum. Um, and they have worked very hard. Some of the things they accomplished this summer, they put unit pacing guides together. Um, they really created student-friendly learning targets and they really dug more deeply into the lessons and the resources available. Um, year one is always about implementation with as much fidelity as possible. Year two really is reflect and refine so you get even better at using all the resources um, from assessment to supplemental. And I think that the teachers are, are poised and ready to go. They're going to tap into the math curriculum specialists to help implement some of the changes that have put together to have an even more successful year two. Anything else, Dr. Lopez? Uh, in, in general, just to, if I can ask a question, this, uh, and I know you've broken it down by bullet points, but you said that 80% found it adequate or very effective. I was wondering if maybe you could provide the difference between, like if you could tell me what percent said adequate and what percent said effective. And, and sure. it could be an update down the road or whatever. Sure. I was just curious, are we leaning towards the very effective or are we leaning towards the adequate? Sure, I would be happy to provide that. Thanks. And, and also, thank you, Scott, because that was where, where I was heading with this. 20% of the teachers indicated program required extensive supplementing. Is that supplementing beyond what we had before, or, or uh, the same folks felt that 20% need supplementing here, and they felt that the program, math program we had before, also needed supplementing? 
So what, what, what's, what's that? We followed up specifically on that question with grade levels that had shared that information with us. And what we found is that the grade levels um, that said that they required the most supplementing were grade levels where the standards had changed the most dramatically. Oh, okay. And so what they had identified was that their students came to them sort of missing some things, struggling, because the curriculum had changed, and they were doing more extensive differentiation at those grade levels. So Tracy Thomas, who's our K-5 math curriculum specialist, is going to work specifically with those teams this year to help them with that. So you would expect that, if, if, if this was repeated next year, you would expect that 20% number to go down? We would expect it to decrease, and we do plan to continue to implement the survey um, to, to see how implementation changes over the next couple of years. You know, one of the things that, that we're measuring still with this baseline survey only being administered in the spring after one year of implementation is, is our newness to the program and our understanding of the, of the standards in the program. I, I was also struck by the comment of the necessity to do review prior to engaging in new materials. Uh, would that also be due to the change and, and not so much carry over and after a year or two of implementation that pretty much will settle down as well, correct? We, we do suspect that that will settle down and it was particularly challenging at, at um, older intermediate grade levels, so at fourth and fifth grade where the standards had changed significantly. Um, our teachers did a lot of formative assessment as students came in, so giving kids some baseline ki quizzes to see where they are and then um, worked with guided flexible groups to try and, and supplement those gaps before they move to the grade level standards. And those quizzes were given this year? They were. Actually, that, that really is best practice. That's something that I, we would support our teachers with focusing on, regardless of, of whether they're implementing a new program or not, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that, um, that we're folk targeting this year is actually formative assessment. You've heard me talk about that a little bit at the board table but sort of starting your lesson or your unit with collecting baseline information about where students are so that you can better customize instruction over the course of that unit. How does, how does the lack of school over the summer months affect that baseline assessment? <laughs> well, a, a proponent of year-round schooling yes. would tell you that it would be better for us if, yes. I, if we didn't bring everything to a grinding halt and then start it up again. But typically, we see kids return to their um, end of year rates within the first month of school, typically. Oh, that quickly. I thought there might have been more of a lag considering the new program, that's why. You know, I think it, it can be understand. different for students depending on their achievement level. So students who are struggling, that summer, those summer months are very hard on them. But for sure. typically developing students, it has less of an impact. One question, Laurie. And I may have asked this before at some point, but how are we doing on what I will call knowledge management among our teachers? So, you know, when I read here that a large number of people thought they needed to supplement the curriculum, so I imagine they did, and they created good stuff that they can use for differentiating instruction. How well do we do on making sure that if teacher A creates something really great for differentiating a fractions unit, that that material is available to teachers B and C within the same school or even teachers within other schools. Do people generally have their own private caches of material or, you know, how well do we do in kind of extracting that and sharing it around? Well, traditionally people do. I think that's, that's been sort of part of our practice as a profession. But one of the things that we worked on this summer, one of the columns of the curriculum pacing guide um, actually provides links um, to the activities that people have, have invented, right, so that everyone can have access to that. Another thing that, um, that Ms. Boyd and I are putting into place this year um, is providing grade level teams with the opportunity to come together uh, through release time and share the ideas that are happening in their classrooms. And then we're hoping to share those things district wide at district grade level meetings. So certainly when you're implementing a new curriculum, one of the opportunities you have is to really target not only fidelity of implementation, as Dr. Hines said, but, but consistency across the school district. Um, one, of, one of sort of the, the premises of a PLC is that everybody has access to everybody's best idea and that nobody's in reinventing the wheel on their own. One of the things that we're hoping to do this year that I'm looking forward to speaking with the board about on October 27th is um, look more closely at our MAP baseline data, right? 
and at where we are in terms of our status and growth um, to help people work with their students to set goals for moving forward. So that's sort of another piece of the puzzle that will help us measure how well we're able to um, consistently implement the curriculum, or successfully implement the curriculum, I should say. Okay, uh, construction. Becky, did you want to say anything about the Maine Township School Treasurer um, economic overview? Um, once a year, um, our Township Treasurer, Mr. Albeck, uh, provides you as a board um, information about his investment practices, and that's what tonight is. Um, we get very little in interest income um, in this economy, um, and someday. I mean, there was a time when districts could see 7 and 8% increase in investment income every year. We just don't get that kind of money anymore. So. Point three. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Mackle, will you join us for the your construction, uh, summer construction update, please? As you can see, we are finishing the concrete part of it today. <laughs> Yes. Right, so um, if you if you want to put your initials in there or something, then you leave that'd be fine. <laughs> but um, stoop right yeah, 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 the yeah, stoop right. there, and uh, we have one more stoop to do at Lincoln, and we'll do that over the weekend. Uh, it, it appears every time we get together on the weekend to try to get started, it starts pouring down rain and delays us a little bit. So uh, that'll be the last piece of of those ancillary projects. Um, field just going fantastic. I mean, you know we're. Uh, We'll be doing the uh, uh, functional testing starting probably the third week of September with Farnsworth. You'll notice in your report after the minutes, there's some uh, reports from Farnsworth and those were the inspections that they made during the project and recommendations of things that they wanted to have done and ready to go for the functional <coughs> testing. So that's all being done. Um, you know, we had our construction meeting last week. Uh, we had a little bit of an issue with uh, uh, one of the, uh, a heat detector and, and the new fire alarm system. So I mean, we've it's really been going very, very well. We will be set up. Uh, controls were put in over the weekend and finished. So now they're they're adding the graphics and and, and putting it on uh, John's desk. And then we've got running an, an additional IP in there for uh, for me to have it on my computer and for the principal to have it on their computer. So we're we're working on that real good and. Field's just been phenomenal. It's just been such a such a great project. Backup generators in and working. Uh, everything over there has been really really well. Okay. Questions? Okay, good. I just wanted to give you an update, as you saw in one of my uh, Friday memos. Um, after spending time talking to um, Dan Walsh, the principal at Franklin, the current second grade teachers, last year's first grade teachers. Um, the fine arts teachers over at Franklin who are watching the numbers all summer. Um, we did decide to pop that second grade section at Franklin, um, communicated with the families that we were going to do that, uh, posted the way we needed to in terms of our contract, and were able to um, place a, do an internal transfer. So a, a staff member that had a TPI position um, in the district is now a second grade teacher at Franklin. She shadowed um, the three classroom teachers on Friday met with the students, and they were able to then start in their new classroom today. So in a relatively short amount of time, we were able to um, to get kids kind of reshuffled um, from three classrooms into four. And um, I think everybody settled in nicely. I, I popped over there today, and um, everybody seemed all right. I only heard from one family that was somewhat concerned, but for the most part, they understood that when you open a section, um, it's a blessing and a curse, as the mom said. Smaller class sizes, giving the kids that need the attention more attention. Um, you know, she was fortunately, unfortunately, my child was sad that she had to leave the teacher that her older brothers and sisters had, but was was reasonable about it and knew that that that, that could happen. So, uh, I think it's it's going smoothly. One of the things we're going to do, um, because I really don't ever like to base these decisions just solely on number. Um, the tipping point for us was the uh, particular makeup of this class, this uh, cohort of students, and uh, Vasiliki, our new Frak, our new uh, assistant director for pupil service and SPED, has already begun working very closely with the second grade teachers, um, really looking at intervention and support services, you know, behavior plans that, that need to be in place, are they in place, um, the level of differentiation that's going to take place. Um, if, if this group is, in fact, um, 
it has a larger number of struggling students as has been shared and as some of the data bears out um, we really want to get targeted in terms of what we're going to do with these kids during their second grade year um, and just push very aggressively to close that gap so that is kind of uh, what we're going to be focusing on now beyond just smaller class sizes we have a ways to go um, to get the kids where we need to get them and the teachers are on board um, and we have administrative uh, support to, to do this work and I think that that combination is what's going to allow us to get the kids up to speed. Bless you, whoever sneezing. A lot of sneezers in this room. Yeah. Some are cold. Okay. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking with Mayor Schmidt for the first time uh, since becoming a Park Ridge employee and gave me a little bit of background um, in terms of the ONCC and um, just really was hoping that on um, October 3rd that at least one representative from District 64 would um, come to the next meeting at the DePaul campus and vote yes in hopes of, of kind of forcing the hand of a, of a new survey to, be, um, to begin to really take a, a look at um, the relationship between air noise and the impact that it has on a community, uh, students within the community, um, and uh, they, they just feel as though this, with 10 years of data and, and new technology, new information, more runways, that it is time to, to go ahead and, and get this survey done. So. Um, Would this survey be an environmental impact study? Yes. Purely environmental, or does that, does the environmental impact study also include noise and everything else? traffic patterns and such. It's the runway traffic patterns will be part of it. But he, the, the mayor called it an environmental impact survey that they were going to do. Um, it, it says under the, the, he was like, let me see, one second. Update the relationship between aircraft noise exposure and its effect on the community, uh, you know, around United States airports. The survey will collect data on annoyance from a representative sample of households and um, the, uh, the annoyance level and the noise exposure with communities that are near, in this case, O'Hare Airport. So they want that survey to be done and um, they, they hope that our district will, will get on board and um, vote yes. Who, who pays for that survey? That I do not know, but I could call Mayor Schmidt back, I bet he does. If I recall the information we originally got on this, I think the idea is to force the city of Chicago to pay for it. Correct, yeah. the city of yeah. the aviation. Right. Aviation department. So, in, in creating a, in creating something like new runways for an airport, to the extent it's a federal action, uh, at some point along the way, there's usually a requirement of doing an environmental impact mm -hmm. study. Uh, and as I understand this, this is an attempt to have that study redone, or to you know have the ONCC argue that some triggering event has happened that requires it to be redone. I don't think the ONCC can force it to be redone, but yeah. I think they can take a position that it should be redone. Correct. And, and that's what I understand the mayor. A number of years for. earlier than, uh, according to the mayor, I think that the survey would, the work has to be done, and then the survey, you get once the work is finished, then you've got another five years to do the survey. So it could be as, as long as 2025. So it just doesn't want to wait that long. I think this is in part stimulated. We've all seen reports in the newspaper of literally thousands of more complaints mm -hmm. being received by uh, specifically the areas of the city of Chicago that are just east of the airport. Um, but I think South Park Ridge also has been reporting an increase in the amount of complaints due to air uh, uh, noise, primarily. Um, I can tell you that since they opened up the uh, 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 Granville uh, uh, runway, um, the stuff that used to fly directly over my house seems to have gone away, and I think it's all down, down on the south side now. Uh, there was at least 45 minutes of every day where you couldn't be outside, uh, and now uh, that's pretty much done. So that had to go someplace. So I'm sure it's Granville, and that's South Park Ridge. Um, and I'm sure they're, they're complaining. So my point being is that I think that the number of flights and the amount of noise may exceed what they had planned for in the original environmental impact studies. And um, I, I personally don't think that it's necessarily a bad idea to go and look at this. Um, I know that they're planning to extend one runway and build one more. And um, 
based on what the data shows from where they are already, they, this report may recommend that no more runways be built. It, it all depends on how this compares to their previous projections, and I don't know that data. So um, I, I, I personally think it's, 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 not a, it's not a down, there's no downside. If you're looking for guidance or whatever, I mean, unless there's some downside I can't foresee that you would warn us of, or some cost that I'm not anticipating, mm -hmm. You know, my inclination would be, yeah, we absolutely might as well. And if you find something along the way like that, let us know, and I'll be happy to give you all more feedback. But as of now, I'd probably say we should. Yeah, yeah. Mayor, sure. Mayor said we'd have a seat at, uh, at the ONCC table, so we should, you know, yeah, fill yeah. it. Yeah, and the way I look at it is, uh, you know, the, this is not an area that I feel comfortable and competent in, and I don't feel that I was elected to uh, make judgments about airport noise. However, Mayor Schmidt was elected to take care of issues like that and so was our city council and I think they've taken a pretty strong position mm -hmm. on this and we happen to have a vote yes or no available to us and so I'd be inclined to say that if Mayor Schmidt wants us to show up and vote yes we ought to show up and vote yes okay good I would remind the board that with the changes that happened at O'Hara and the change in the runway and the change in the landing pattern is the reason that we got sound abatement money for Roosevelt School Right. So, I hear a consensus for moving forward. Um, the date at uh, DePaul is going October to be... October 3rd, I believe it's uh, Yes, October 3rd. Do we know what, what date that is? No. Do we need a board member to be present okay. at that, or...? Becky or I can go. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a Friday. Becky or I will go. Driving into the city is always so fun on Friday. Right, yeah. Getting out's the hard part. Just lastly, I'm working with uh, Dr. Wallace. Pardon? Oh, it's not like the city sitting, it's like the board. Okay. We so can do anyway, it like just, just before we leave this topic, so you will be able to communicate with uh, Mayor Schmidt mm -hmm. tomorrow that yes. we have uh, board consensus for his initiative. Will do. Thank you. And lastly, just I can't recall. If I told you, we are convening on October 2nd, the internal calendar committee to start the conversation regarding what we may do in response to District 207's calendar. And then at a, one of our October board meetings, we will bring that information to you and um, begin a conversation with the board in terms of how we would like to proceed um, and, and make that decision in terms of what are we going to do with our our calendar. Are we going to line up? Are we going to keep our calendar the same? Are we going to a midway point? How we're going to seek feedback from the community? Um, uh, Scott asked me to to get copies of the survey questions, which um, Dr. Wallace shared with me today, and I will make them available for the committee and then for the board. So I'm right now gathering as much information as possible. We will have a representative from the high school um, that always serves on the calendar committee. Uh, last name is Dietz. He will be with us again, and um, you know, Dr. Wallace said he's also willing to come to the meeting because he knows it's a big decision that has, you know, a ripple effect. So, now just so you're aware, you I guess there's kind of a petition going That's around. That's what he said. To, to petition bring for it to the board to go unring the bell in favor of this. Right. So there, there may be an, another election or a vote to say to review this again for 207 to change their From calendar. The Dr. Wallace um, said his board uh, is not um, usually in favor of undoing a decision that they've made. But if they come, you know, to, to public comment, then that's their forum well, to express their Supposedly they get X amount of signatures, like a, that a thousand is what I heard, then it, the board will have to review it, and they do have a couple new board members, mm. so. Interesting. So they're questioning the 207 updated calendar, that's what the petition They're about. opposing it. 207 is there's a group that is not in favor of the new calendar. Mm -hmm. Lori, I guess my one suggestion in our process would be um, let's make sure, if at all possible, that we can survey our own community mm -hmm. before we make a change. Absolutely. I know I've already received one email from a parent you who has an me. opinion. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that parent, I'm sure, is particularly well informed, but we will get lots, lots more before we. Right. Last make week any I decision. met with the township superintendents, Dr. Wallace, uh, Dr. Clay, Dr. Westerholder, and um, 
Dr. Um, Lohringer from Pinoyer, and we are going to all survey, and we're going to use the same survey instrument. So we have a unified way and the same questions that we're going to ask. Um, so that will be done. We know for sure we're going to survey, and it's just if we want to take it any further and do you know, public forums or if we're going to take um, just the survey information. Dr. Wallace did say um, when 207 made their decision, the survey was just one component. And it wasn't based on the popular survey result. It was used as a point of information to gauge how the community was feeling about it. With, with the survey and uh, questions you'll give us, you'll also have the, um, the results. The results, yeah, because uh, I had received some uh, some questions as well, and there was some questions about the survey methodology and the questions that were asked. So I kind of wanted to see it firsthand because, um, you know, it was sort of like, yeah, I have a survey question, but the results were surprising. And so I wanted to see what that He's got it broken down in graphs and whatnot Perfect. that he's going yeah, to share. I want to see those actual questions. Oh, yeah. So that would be great. And there was just three questions. It's a very, it was a very simple survey. Yeah. So I'll, I'll share that with the board Thank at you. our next meeting. Um, and I believe that's it. Okay. One, one final thing. Uh, we are uh, in possession tonight of the updated board operating plan with updated financials. And I'm glad to see that. Thank you, uh, Bernadette. Thank you, Becky. And uh, thank you for everybody. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that needs to get on our web. So I'm hopeful that this will be uh, updated and uploaded soon, particularly the graphs that we had talked about. And now that the budget process is almost at its conclusion, um, in your plan, I think that you've got some time allocated to to work on building the financial aspect of the web, is that correct? Uh, that's a conversation Bernadette and I will, and Dr. Hines will have to have. Yes. That's on the it's on the year the roadmap to have a larger financial right. as well as curricular footprint on the web. Right. So yeah, we can figure out how to how to make that happen. And Tony, I'm glad, or Dr. Burley, I'm glad you mentioned this. So one of the things that the administrative team has been talking about and kind of grappling with, if you look at the second page, or really it's the first page beyond the cover, um, the District 64 operating um, plan board consensus goals. So in the blue column, this is clearly your consensus goals, and then here you have action plans and metrics. So where we've been struggling, one, because it's just such a teeny tiny little space to try to fit a, a variety of things that we're working on, we're pushing on a lot of levers here. Um, there was some level of redundancy and some level of there are things within the roadmap that are not necessarily present here. So what is the best way to have these two speak to each other and focus on the same key items, if you will? We didn't want to just overhaul this doc that you worked so hard to create, um, especially because it was called board consensus goals. <laughs> um, but we know this is our driver. This is our roadmap of some of the big things administratively that we're working on. So do you have suggestions or we've been grappling with it for uh, several weeks? So I'd have to, um, if you, I mean, I, I really like the, the idea of having the goals, action plans, and metrics mm -hmm. on here. I mean, the overall goal of this document, right, is so that a community member can pick this up and they can spend an hour looking mm -hmm. at it and they have a much better understanding of what the board is trying to do as far as our goals go, where we sit financially, and um, overall kind of where, where we're at with our resources. So. Um, I, I like this format, you know, but that, that's one person's opinion, mm -hmm. obviously. I've been involved in it. I, I believe I haven't looked at this one in a little while. Um, there probably is some overlap here. I'm, I'm okay with tweaking this a little bit, but I, and you read in my email that I sent you, right. I, I don't want to eliminate this page, because if we eliminate this page, then this just turns into just a lot of numbers. And I think that then people got to start digging into things to really understand our plan. I think that this page is critical if someone actually wants to figure out what are what we want to accomplish as a board. So what we tried to do is, with student learning facilities and finance, we tried to update and pull a lot of the significant information from the roadmap and put it into here. Um, we, we did a few strike through, or just one strike through it looks like, but we did try to swap out and update it to the best of our ability, but I don't know that we fit you everything. Know, I, I'm wondering if, um we could break this down into short-term, long-term goals. Um, you know, the, the plan that the board has come up with that was initiated by Dan, you know, we're, we're looking down the road, and I, I'd like to consider 
those ideas as long-term goals of where we need to be, the five-year goal plan, for instance. And, and the roadmap, arguably, is the next one to two years. And there's going to be overlap. I mean, there's, there's some principles that are going to be carried out now that we're going to be doing later. But I really kind of look at it as short-term goals and long-term goals. And, and they could be enumerated as such. And then strategic planning, as you know, we'll, we'll embark on, upon that in the, the uh, winter and that'll carry us through the spring in terms of our work. And then, you know, this will take a totally different, some of the areas of focus will change based on what comes out of strategic planning. So we just wanted you to have an understanding that we tried to get as much of this in here and then also honor some of the other information that you set aside as, you know, important areas to monitor or to focus on. But we were just struggling you know, with this format. I guess from it. my own perspective, I loved it when Dan and I, you know, you sat down and showed me the idea. And what you're explaining to me makes some sense. Uh, I, perhaps I'm having trouble visualizing it. I, I think when we adopted that, we all thought, well, let's go with this. And now in the light of a year's worth of using it, if you think it should be laid out somewhat differently, or look, I think we'd all be open to the idea of looking at a draft of something and saying, oh, yeah, this makes sense. You know, I mean, I agree with Dan. I want to make sure that that's never lost. Yeah. But if it's a, hey, you know, it would be really useful if this one little section was expanded ever so slightly so that we could get extra things in there that would be useful, I'd say throw something on a piece of paper and we can talk about it a little bit. It makes sense to me because I, I don't want to lose what we've got. But if we can gain a couple things, too, that are meaningful and it doesn't get to become, you know, a 40-page document, I'd be, I'd be open to the idea. I just don't want it to get to be right. where no one reads it now because it's too much. It's too cumbersome. Yeah, that's, that's right, Scott. That's what we're trying to stay away from this. Right. Right. 40 page document right. five, yeah. But if the ideal is it's one more page, yeah. yeah I can and then talking, ultimately, so ultimately, really thinking for next year, MJ is going to wince. Yeah. Um, there's a feature within our new website that we can actually construct an actual digital dashboard. So then this can move. It should be. And so for extra cost or no cost? No, I don't think it's an extra cost or is it an extra cost? No. The module's extra cost. free, really. So no, there's an extra cost. There's an ex She's saying no. <laughs> There's an extra cost. So yeah. it might be worth an extra cost. to have a real live dashboard that's real time has value as opposed to yes, updating it at periodic intervals when time allows. So I'd much rather have it down, digital for next year. That's what I'd like, and MJ yeah. has this yeah. on her list the, of particularly if financial should be real time. Exactly. That's where yeah. we're going. Financial and actually, I say curriculum. Yes, it would be great to have a dashboard in terms of where scores are and so forth, so that a, someone can go at any time and say, "I want to look at how we're doing on." On our academics, I want to look at how we're doing on our budget and get an understanding. So that's so, on the spring summer yeah, kind of to-do list. Yeah, yeah. I love it. It's to investigate that and what it'll look like. So, <laughs> just are we ready to kind of take this out? Then we've been talking about it a long time. I'd like to be able to say, all right, we throw this at the community now, so they have something. And like Scott said, we can make it better over time. But are we ready to? So that's, that's a great question. Let's do this now that I kind of have gotten yeah. the, the vibe of the, the group here, the board. Um, we have a. ESC this team in the room here we meet every Monday so we'll take one last look at it all of our categories all of our bullets cross check it from the roadmap make sure it's where we need it and then if on the 18th which is a handful of days from now um, I shall bring it to you in a final form and then we'll be ready to roll does that sound good yep sounds good. okay lastly um, on September 11th if any of you want to go to uh, the Southside fire station number 35 um, the Roosevelt score School choir uh, will be there to sing the national anthem, and I guess it's just a really nice program that they do every year. So I plan to start my day there, and I think it'll be nice if any of you are free, hop on over. And then there are just a few other things that were at your seat: protecting your school district from TIF districts. If you wanted to, <laughs> yeah, irony wasn't lost there. And then there's just um, the one-page uh, timeline in terms of the election that Tony said just went live today on the website. I gave it to you in case you wanted to just add that to you. Just came out today. Okay. Alrighty. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Uh, any other comments, questions by the board? And uh, not hearing or seeing any, um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any? Aye. <laughs> okay. Any opposed? None. Thank you.